Hey. Good evening once again. I would like to welcome you to a little bit more reading from the Ghetto Sketches here at Cafe Zola's. Uh-huh. So that sketches. is Ghetto Sketches. This is Ghetto Sketches, my first published book. Uh-huh. And I published guess... Published originally in 1972, been reissued about three times, right. three, three times. and possibly will be reissued again uh, in the coming year, but that's something in the future. Yesterday, I read the prologue in the book and the foreword by Dr. Marvin Burroughs, the, uh, the person who established the Dinsolva Museum of African American History in Chicago. I always have to say that, I always feel compelled to say that because she was the person who put the notebook in my hand and put the, <laughs> at the time, the number two pencil in my hand and almost forced me to, to scribble. Right. So I owe her a whole lot. This continues with something that I'm calling Saturday Night. It's sort of a uh, poetic, uh, whimsical kind of thing. And then it'll take us into uh, what happens in the neighborhood in the coming days, for those who might be interested. And in the coming days, let us say within the next two weeks, I will have explored the whole inside of this whole book. But for right now, it's going to be Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Saturday night, any Saturday, the main stem sizzles and crackles with the flick of neon lights, the popping of stale fish grease, the mad aroma of barbecued ribs, hickory smoked, steaming chitlins, boiled greens, candy yams, bean pies, Louisiana battered fried shrimp, ham hocks and things, and the horny sounds of people in love with the night. In love with the night. Mm -hmm. It carries a sweet Peter's swirling off onto the fast tracks where they spend their lives twisting, turning, and dancing on pinheads larger than their lives will ever be. The stem swirls in a straight line down 47th Street, heading for Buttermilk Bottom, the Fillmore District, Crenshaw, or the dusty, crusty surface of Gwinnett Street in deepest Georgia, or to any other place in the New World where the brothers had to take his chances no matter whether the chance has been for a Fulani queen in glorious red or for a change in fortune that may rest on the roll of a pair of loaded dice. The gambling joint in the basement. A large, round, green felt covered table dominates the room. A stench of men, past and present, Mingled with the defective plumbing dominates the atmosphere. A single bulb hanging at the end of a single black cord and the light gleaming through the green visor around the bulb gives everything and everybody in the room a dead, shadowy look. Cigarette and cigar smoke curls into the air above the table, creating a haze above the seven men standing around the table, mumbling bets, snatching, grasping, and gambling. The gambling goes on in a serious, dedicated fashion, and everybody knows why they're there, and they do not be jiving. The action is sweet Peter D's, but he's cool about it. The look of motion puts drama into the air, charges the atmosphere, Suggest to the stick man that he should change the bones or whatever. The action of the table suddenly stops his flow as one of the men's veins bubbling in his temples shouts across the table, Nigga, if you don't lay that money back down, you're going to have all 215 pounds of me in your motherfucking chest, and I ain't just bullshit neither. He's answered with equal heat. Is that right? Is that right? 
Well, I don't see no goddamn fences between us. The only thing keeping your 215 pounds out of my chest is your good sense and the ass kicking you have to receive it if you keep on fucking with me. I know your mama didn't raise no fools. A couple of the other dudes, irritated by the interruption, voiced their displeasure in no uncertain terms. Oh, come on, man. Y'all take that shit somewhere else. I'm losing. Yeah, why don't y'all sell that shit some other time? Fuck all you motherfuckers. That's the second time J.D. and made an ass bet. Sweet Peter coolly measures the situation and slips in obliquely. Uh, let it pass, move, mule papa. I'll make it good. Get on with the game. The sudden roaring levels out, quiets back down to the normal mumble, grumble, bet, bet, grumble, bumble, mumble. Goes on for a few long minutes, hundreds of hard-earned dollars being exchanged. Won. Lost. I didn't had enough of this shit out of you, J.D. You think you one of them slick-ass motherfuckers. The man called Mule Papa whips around the curve of the table, snatching and hitting at J.D. Sweet Peter D. obviously caught up with the idea of a little diversion. Lails out, don't stop him. Don't, don't, don't stop him. The niggas gone and fight. They've been trying to get a piece of each other's ass since last week. Go ahead. Let them have it out. The gamblers snatch the money from the green felt table and give the combatants room to duke in. And naturally, being gamblers, pick favors. Go on, kick that jab motherfucker's ass, mule papa. He a hard losing chicken shit, son of a bitch. Anyway, starts crying every time he drops the bed. Yeah, go on, kick his ass. Oh, what the fuck you talking about? Don't let that cocksucker be the rest of you, J.D. Mule papa and J.D., two big, strong working dudes. Wrestle and pull each other around. He's trying desperately to pull an arm free to jab at the other one or to gain enough leverage to sling the other one's ass to the to the ground. The scene is almost that of a human cockfight. The men lacking spurs but trying to use their fists in the way that fighting cocks use their spurs as the gamblers and the shadowed fringes make bets on the outcome. I got 10 to say Mew Papa going to slam J.D. on his ass. Make that 20, you got yourself a bet. All right then, goddammit, 20 says he'll do it. Now put your money where your mouth is. Bet! <laughs> the two men give their 20s to a third party, a neutral, just standing in place, calmly watching the contest. The noise being made inside drowns out the loud, ouch! Made by Detective Jones as he bumps his shin against a solid object in the unfamiliar darkness outside the back door of the gambling joint. Watch your step, Jonesy, his partner whispers to him. These niggas may have set booby traps on you. Jonesy smiles in spite of the ache in his shin, thinking to himself, <laughs> just like Murph, can <laughs> make a joke no matter what the circumstances. They ease up to the door. What the racket? I'll be damned if I know it sounds like somebody fighting. Damn it, my shin bone threw up something off. You okay, Josie? Eh, I'll live. Hey, somebody's fighting in there. Go on, knock. It'll be kicks to see the look on these monkeys' faces when we walk in. <laughs> Detective Murphy, jaws clenched tightly, authoritatively, thumps on the door with the butt of his pistol. Sweet Peter cocks his ear to the sound. Grab the fool. Be cool. Sounds like. Hey, what the hell you doing? Me and Raymond got it back down. Shut up, Jimmy. Mew Papa and JD are pried apart, each of them mildly grateful for the interruption, but reluctant to show it for my she's most stake. Each of them held up, arms pinned, glared at each other, ribs caving in from the struggle, wind coming back in gaps. Mump Mercury thumps again. All right, and they open up. Sweet Peter Dita, playing the high post position, gives wordless efficient instruction with finger, eye, and head motions. A checkered tablecloth is pulled from underneath the table and quickly spread over the green felt. Murphy and Jonesy, irritated beyond reason now, both thump on the door. Open up in there, God damn it! The well-oiled movements of the men inside snatched four folding chairs from a dark corner, arranged them quickly around the table. Four of the men sit at a table, a deck of cards, 
popped from a breast pocket and one of them begins to deal a wit's hand while the other ones lounge about casually. The whole situation, practiced to lard like slickness, takes no more than a minute. No more than a minute. Open this goddamn door or we'll break it down. Sweet Peter, standing near the door, throws a sly wink on the group and calls out in a soft voice. Uh, who is it? <laughs> Murphy and Jones turn to each other in the dark. Well, I'll be... Jones, did you hear? Murphy turns back to the door to venture. Open up, damn you! This is the police! Sweet Peter calmly bolts a trio of locks and stands aside innocently as the two detectives rush in, pistols out looking red-faced, angry, and insane. Both Jones and Murphy, dressed right-wing style in their monotone three-button suits, snap brim hats, and dull hue ties, look at the colorfully assembled group of black men with disgust and hate. All right, everybody up. Who's running the game here? Jonesy asks, waving his pistol from one head to the other. Sweet Peter D. casually lights a cigarette, studying the two detectives. Gene, the whisk dealer, looks around with big, innocent brown eyes and mumbles, uh, we're just playing whist, uh, officer. <laughs> Don't need nobody to run that, you know. <laughs> just a good partner. The other dudes dig in Gene's subtle humor share the spirit and feeling of him signifying with the pigs. Jones, not quite certain of where the sarcasm is coming from, but feeling his way through the context. God damn it, don't be making jokes with me, fella. We know you guys shoot crap in this hole every Saturday night. Now what we want to know is who the hell's running the damn store? Once again, Gene trying to pull a little more humor over the white man's eyes by slyly using his language, responds to the group. Ain't nobody shoot nothing here, Mr. Officer. You can see that with your own eyes. Mm. Murphy, already highly pissed, rushes over to Gene the Joker and shoves him over the back of his chair. Gene springs up from the floor, anxious to be in Murphy's chest. Murphy levels his piece of Gene's head and warns him in cold metallic voice, take one wrong move, tough guy, and I'll blow you away. Sweet Peter D, standing a bit off to the side, checking out the tension and things slides in smoothly, evenly. Well, no need to do that, officer. Like I said, all we're doing is just playing some funny cards. Murphy and Jones glance at the speaker, waving their pistols around like banana leaves, seeming to be aware for the first time that they are in a dank, dingy basement in the ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> it shows a bit in the overly harsh quality of Jones's voice as he yells, All right, you monkeys, line up three paces from that wall. Everybody, move it. Lean into it. Three paces away. Lean into it on your fingertips. Spread your leg. You guys know how to do it. What do you say, Murph? I've had enough. We can stick a disturbance of the peace on them, if nothing else. Mingled with the disgusted, angry sounds of the men slamming their cards down on the table are the small clacking noises of knives and other weapons being surreptitiously dropped under the table. Move it, goddammit! Oh shit, ain't this a bitch? Ain't you dudes got nothing better to do than going around hassling folks? Be cool, move, Papa. Be cool. Everything gonna be all right. Murphy, with a special thing going for Gene, shares him roughly. Get your black ass neck to that wall before I give you a mouthful of pistol butt. The men grumble and reluctantly spread themselves along the wall, prodded by the law. Jones hands his piece over to Murphy and begins moving efficiently down the row of men, frisking. He pauses the JD, checks the bruises on his face, and ripping his shirt. What happened to you, buddy boy? Looks like we got here on here just in time, huh? <laughs> How about that, Murph? We got here just in time. Yeah, pretty good, Jonesy. Pretty good. Pretty good. Jonesy pulled a straight razor out of an anonymous, anonymous pocket. You boys really play for keeps, huh? The face at the wall comes back sharply with a sarcastic right on. While Jones is two people away searching bodies, Sweet Peter Dita leans away from the wall 
and boldly faces the two detectives. Murphy, a pistol in each hand, blinks several times as though he was seeing something unreal happen and then takes careful aim with his right hand. Hey, you, you, you heard the man face that wall. Lean into it and keep your legs spread. Joan looks up from his ankle and calf rubbing to watch Sweet Peter Dealer's action with the same incredible look on his face, moves quickly back from the line of men, snatches his pistol from Murphy, and takes aim also. Okay, you, you got five seconds to get it back. Sweet Peter Dealer looks from one flushed red face to the other, seeming to measure the amount of hostility in each one. Coolly, calmly, uh, officer. He directs himself to Jones. Uh, officer, I wonder if I could speak to you privately for a moment. Something about the insinuating tone of Sweet Peter's voice grabs Jones the other. Okay, you come on over here and make it snappy. I'd like to have a whole bunch of you bastards booked by 12th night. Okay, what is it? Spit it out. Sweet Peter strolls slowly, casually over to a far, shadowy corner. Uh, can we step over the officer? Jones, showing off his fearlessness, trailed Sweet Peter with his pistol held aggressively. You running this show? Maybe. Murphy, from the side of his mouth, con style. Careful with that guy, Jonesy. Don't worry, Murphy, I got him covered. I wish you would make a wrong move. Jones stands facing Sweet Peter and Dita in a shaded corner, his eye running hatefully up a burgundy tailored vision of two toned baby alligator stasis. All right, soul brother, what do you want? A separate deal from the rest of these monkeys, or what? Sweet Peter looks slightly above Jones's head, as though he was staring at a distant picture, and replies in a low, flat voice. No. Nah. No, I don't want nothing like that, officer. I just want you and your partner to put your pieces away and split. White policeman in the colony Jones glares into the smooth, dark face as though he can't quite decide which way he'd like to kill him. His face turns brick red and then stark gray with anger. Sweet Peter, sensing the danger, goes on quickly, urgently. Now take it. <laughs> I didn't really want to get off into all of this but you forced my hand. So now I'm going to have to run the whole scene down to you because evidently you knew in the picture. At least this is my first time seeing you. Jones raises his pistol butt at Sweet Peter's head. Ah, the Sweet Peter cuts in sharply to save his head. Wait now, hold on, hold on. Let me finish. I'm paying your captain, that's right. Your good Captain Rainey. 1,600 skins a month plus bonuses to have this, this little game every Saturday and some other little things. And I think he'd be highly pissed if Alderman Harley had to jump in his ass about you making an author, unauthorized raid on our joint. Sweet Peter finishes his statement and it almost seems as though steam is rising between the two men. Jones is so put out he can only puff his jaws out before exploding between clenched teeth. Are you, are you, are you trying to tell me what to do? You? No, no. I ain't trying to tell you what to do. I'm trying to tell you what not to do. What's your name, fella? Sweet Peter glances up and down the row of men, leaning casually now on the wall, exchanges a wink with J.D., Flicks an imaginary, imaginary speck of dust from his razor-sharp, creased pants. And with as much understatement as he could muster replies, they called me Sweet Peter Dita. Jones, looking around uncomfortably to Murphy, his face still blocked from his hate flush, calls on them. Murphy, you hear that? I got a live one over here. Calls himself Sweet Pickles or some such shit. Listen to me, sweet pickles, get this straight. When I want advice from the likes of you, I'll ask for it. Now move your ass back over to that wall. We'll have the wagon out in a few minutes and you can give your special little story to the death sergeant. 
Sweet Peter strolls nonchalantly back to his position, a slight smile breaking down each corner of his mouth. Jones scuttles over to Murphy, pulls him a short distance from the men at the wall and begins to whisper into his ear ferociously, Murph, this black bastard says he's got rain in his hip pocket. Murphy shrugs, never taking his eyes from the men at the wall and mumbles, yeah, yeah, I know. What the hell are you talking about? You know what? Murphy turns briefly to glance with a blank expression at his partner. I know about Brainy's deal. I thought you did too. Mm. Jones mm. stares at Murphy with a classic idiot's droop of a mouth. Are you off your nut? Do you think I would have suggested we raid this fucking joint if I'd known that Rainy had a piece of the action? What do you take me for, goddamn fool? I got four kids to feed. Hell, Jones, I thought you knew. The men lined up along the wall, snickered softly at the exchange. Gene, the joker, having recovered his sense of humor, sings out in an ultra-polite voice. Officer, sir, are we going to have to lean up against this goddamn wall all night? Jones stares hatefully at the back of Gene's head. Shut your trap! He screams at him and turns back to Murph. I thought everyone knew. I just thought you wanted to make, you know, shake the bastards up a bit. Ah, well, come on, you know how it is. You hear rumors, but I didn't really think Rainey was on the take. Murphy shrugs his shoulders affirmatively. The two men stand, stand and look at each other for a long minute, understanding what has to be done. <sighs> Jones bursts out, the words almost strangling him. All right, you bums. Turn around. We didn't catch you with the goods tonight, but if we ever do catch anything fishy going on in here, we're going to bust a whole bunch of you. Got that? The men smirking at what has gone down mumbled in agreement. Uh, right on. Oh, yes, officer, sir. Jones walks over slowly to Sweet Peter glares hatefully into his face for a moment and then suddenly rams the barrel of his pistol into his stomach. The men respond to Jones's act with a show of hostility. Show us why don't you do something like that, man? Whoa, that's what I call having a bad temper. Murphy and Jones stand watching Sweet Peter sink down into a nearby chair, holding his belly and groaning. The men begin to edge up on Jones and Murphy. Okay, you guys, take one more step and somebody's going to get hurt. Sweet Peter cautions the men, be cool, y'all, be cool. Let, let these crazy motherfuckers out of here, be y'all, be cool. Murphy waves his pistol in Sweet Peter's direction momentarily and then turns to his partner. Come on, Jonesy, let's get out of this rat hole. The stink is making me sick. They move slowly toward the door, paying close attention to the bloodshot eyes and balled up fists. Murphy shouts, shouts at him at the door. Remember what we said. If we catch a tiddlywinks game going on here, we're going to bust a whole bunch of you. I'll bet. Murphy slams the door as hard as possible. You all right, Pete? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Oh, man. Goofy, goofy motherfucker. <laughs> Put a hell of crap in my belly. I think the little one just got transferred into the district. Must be trying to put his bluff in. Either that or you don't know what's happening. Why did he shove his piece in your, in, in your belly, sweets? Sweet Peter Dita stretches himself into an erect position of the chair. Massages his stomach a bit. Ah, man, you know. You know how these motherfuckers hate niggas. And Lord knows I'm a super nigga. <laughs> Take this fucking cloth off the table. Let's go on with the game. He checks his watch. And stands up quickly, groaning a little from the hurt. Smitty, take the house from me. I got to take care of some business. The men remove the cloth with a real symbol around the table. The smoke haze gathering strength above their heads after a few minutes of intense concentration. I got my eye on you, J.D. Get your motherfucking bed down. They're going to stop flapping your jaws at me. I'd like to leave here tonight with your socks in my hip pocket. <laughs> Who's dice it? Why don't y'all stop talking that shit and play? Bam! Motherfuckers burst that kids. Shit. Come down here to gamble and win some money. 
got to put up with all this jaw jacking and mumbo jumbo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sweet Peter Dita stands underneath the street lamp on his corner, leaning against his rise, smoking a cigarette, riffling through Idella's bruise deep in his pocket as he spools little honey bits of game into her hot little ear. From somewhere, like a liquid breeze, the sound of an eastern wind instrument slithers through the warm night air. Is the money right, Daddy? It's right now. But it was supposed to have been right this afternoon. You know how much I hate having to bruise my knuckles and shit? Like, you know that I don't. I just can't understand why you come to me the way you do sometimes. I mean, like, your shit goes so far out of pocket. All it does is force Daddy to keep that pressure on. And you know yourself deep down, as strong as you is, there really is no need for me to be constantly staring your ass about us getting our thing together. You know that? Adela's eyes wander in circles around Sweet Peter as though he were encased in a shaft of light or as, or as if a halo gleamed from his frame. I'm going to do better, Daddy, you see. And then you won't have no reason to be soft at me. What time is Lulu coming in? She'll be here in exactly 15 minutes. The sound of the slurring music pauses and then starts again at a lower register, a kind of Eric Dolphy, you soft Latifish sound in an Arabic mode. Bam and Baby June shuffle past, already a half hour away from pain, trying with all their dope fiend cunning to hear Jones off at the pass. Bam eases up to Sweet Peter's side, scratching and sniffling. <laughs> Hey, look at here, bud. Quick, man. How about them comments you said you wanted? Yeah, yeah. Baby June ass, picking delicate to tip his nose. Yeah. <laughs> we even got some, something that would really look. He pauses and nods for a few sacred seconds and then picking up his thought again. Yeah, 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 sure would be out of sight, out of sight on this sister woman here. Sweet Peter waves him away with an impatient, check with me later on, I ain't got all my shit taken care of yet. Yeah, oh, okay, sweet, we'll check with you later on. Yeah, cool, that'd be my love. We'll check with you later on. Bam and baby June shuffle away, their faces twisted into unprintable expressions, lips cooked, white, sniffling and scratching. From an apartment building down the street, a couple of party goers weave unsteadily down the stairs to the streets. The hostess leans out of her second floor window. Echoes of Roberta, Aretha, Mother Popcorn, and BB drifting out over her shoulder. You better hold his hand, Lucille, else he might stumble out there and get hit by one of them cars. Lucille Smith. Her arm firmly hooked into the crook of her husband's arm looks up with a giddy, amused expression. Don't you worry about a thing, child. My old man can take care of him and me. Been doing it for years. Ain't that right, baby? Fergus Smith nods his head agreeably. Lucille, you gonna make it to church tomorrow morning? Lord willing, and I wake up in time. Stop by for y'all go and holler at me. All right, I'll do that. Y'all take it easy now. Good night. Had a real good time. See you now, hell. Lucille and Fergus Smith, head smoky but held high, strolled past Sweet Peter Dita, paused on the steps of their apartment building, listening to the keening, wailing sound of the eastern sounding instrument, quivering and throbbing with intensity now. Lucille Smith holds her head in mock tragedy. Oh, my God. Don't tell me that fool is up blowing on that thing with you again. Well, ain't no louder than the music we just came from. It's a damn sight stranger, I know that. They weave upstairs to their apartment, giggling and feeling happy about being in the same uncoordinated state together. Luberger Franklin and Quindy Jones stroll up the other side of the street. Quindy checks Sweet Peter on his corner, disgust written all over his face. 
Lulu stepped up the street moving fast, fast, fast. Mm -mm -mm. A few people around, lounge around the front stoop of the block, seeking the air of the street and the drama in it. Sweet Peter D. as though timing a racehorse or some other sporting event, stands looking at the second hand on his watch. His expression is deadpan as he tells Lulu, didn't think you were going to make it for a minute. You know me, sweets. I always make it. How do you go? Lulu gives a brief, malicious, cutting look at Idella before Hampson. I did twice as good as I thought I was going to do. Sweet Peter, catching a look, rubs a pinch of salt into the wound. Beautiful, beautiful star. My woman don't do nothing but take care of business. Dig, I got to run on back to the joint and check on things. You two run on to the crib. Lulu, run some water for me, will you, baby? Stick some of that uh, skin off of soft stuff in it. That oil, you mean? That's right, the oil. Adela, see if you can't do something right the first time for a change. Lay out my ice water suit and my triple tone suede boots. If everything is looking all right, we might be able to get out here and party time a little bit with the rest of these niggas. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can really dig that. They got a new group down at their apartment. People say they don't be doing nothing but playing music, 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 and more music. Just be cool. Now, I'll tell you, I got to go back and check on my action first. See if it's flowing smooth, then we'll get out there. Shouldn't take me too long to find out. The two splits, the trio splits. Lulu and I dull in one direction, Sweepy the Deed in another. The street, except for an occasional straggler, a cast off from someplace or something, is empty. Psst. Psst. All right, June, let it down. Ain't nobody out here now. Be careful, don't break it. Baby June, bracing himself from the inside, a first floor apartment lowers a portable TV down on the end of a length of clothesline. June, what you gonna tell your mother when she wake up tomorrow and find her TV missing? Baby June jumps out the window after lowering the TV into Bam's hands, lands lightly, athletically, beside him. What the fuck you mean? What I'm gonna tell her? I'm gonna tell her somebody stole one of her. Oh, I already did it. We wouldn't even be needing to be doing this if you had listened to me. Fuck all that. How was I supposed to know that the motherfucker was selling us base face power the second time we'd ever cop from him? You didn't know yourself till you started trying to fit. Come on, help me carry this damn thing. I told you, I told you, I said, remember I said, June, dig. The two dumpy junkies ease off into the shadows of the alley on their way to oblivion. The weight of the portable TV straining the strength of their trapped up arms. Mm. And if the Saturday night and if the Sunday night services have not dealt with it all or haven't had time, if a soulful problem remains, one that goes beyond the recognized boundaries, remains aloof from the sweet songs and glib prayers to Jesus the Christ, or dries up in a stifled puddle on the cracked sidewalks, then there is someone else, something else that can brought to bear. Dark powders, ground up roots, scented herbs, and flickering candles that burn seven days, blessed by holy mouths filled with sacred green snuff, can be sought out. The powders, the roots, the herbs, and candles can be found in dark spaces the leak ancient rites filled with African blood. Small cramped huts stacked in piles, one on top of the other. Huts that are made of stone and steel now, but still carry a dark message sent from ancestors whose bones are found in the new world. Old bodies in which to live. A timid staccato knocking, knocking on the back door of apartment 301. 307, sorry y'all. Miss Rabbit, glasses down on her nose, tip half dozing, half reading her Bible, looks up apprehensively at the sound of the tapping. Miss Rabbit edges towards the door on tiptoe, every muscle in her squat frame tense. Who is it? It's me, Miss Rabbit. Me, Lena Daniels. Miss Rabbit cocks her head, strained to determine if the voice is the person it says it is. 
Who that you say? Me, Miss Rabbit. Me, Leon Daniels. This rabbit opens the door quickly and shoes Leon inside. Honey, what in the world are you doing traipsing around in the middle of the night? Don't you know Hans is loose out there? Just ain't none of them dope fiends or whatnot. Leon stands in front of the door, arms crossed under her ample bosom, looking around nervously. You're right, Miss Rabbit, but I just had to see you. I just had to. Miss Rabbit, one eyebrow raised perceptively, motions toward her worn sofa. Well, come on over here and sit down. Sure must be important for you to be running around the alley this time of night. What's wrong? One of the children sick? Lena squirms around restlessly on the sofa, coming to the rest on the edge. Oh, no, no. You're all right. This, uh, this rabbit reaches over to pat her hand reassuringly. No, no, honey. Just calm down and tell Miss Rabbit what the problem is. Lena turns her head away from Miss Rabbit's gaze, stares at a worn down broom standing in a far corner. Oh, I don't write for the know how to come out and tell you. Miss Rabbit pulls a pack of cigarettes from her apron pocket, lights up and waits and waits. Well, see, Miss Rabbit, it's like this. <clears throat> you know, me and Jim have been mad going on nine years. I remember when y'all first come up here. You remember that? We just got married and decided to move from Biloxi because Jim thought, uh huh, uh yeah, 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 I remember all that. Go ahead, right on about the other thing. Lena's eyes circled the room and dropped down to her hands, tightly folded in her lap. Well, what I was going to say was, well, we ain't never really, we ain't never really had too many problems, man, Jim. I mean, it's been kind of hard at times when, like, when Jim lost his job, but, but he lately he started he started staying out late. Got me money off. I don't know what all. But whenever I ask him about what he's doing, he won't say nothing. Either that, he want to fight me. This rabbit looks into Lena's face with a faint smile tugging at her mouth. <laughs> you think you got another woman out there somewhere, there? Huh? Lena nods sadly. She looks back over into the corner, tears clouding her eyes. I was thinking, I was thinking, maybe you could help me, Miss Rabbit. We got five kids. I really love Jim, Miss Rabbit. I really do. It's rather stares compassionately at Lena for a full minute, blowing smoke rings. <sighs> then suddenly she waddles away into the other room, returns minutes later with a small brown paper bag. Now you listen to me closely, Lena, man. Do everything just like I say, and you won't have no more worries with Jim. Leastways, not this year anyway. Jim at home now? No, man. He slept. A while this afternoon, after he chased Jaya and them away from our back, I heard all that commotion. But I ain't gonna get my head blown off by accident. Well, after he chased them away, he slept for a bit. Got up around about 6.30. Now, I ain't seen or heard from him since then. Hmm. Well, now, here's what you do. When you get the chance, First thing you do is put two pinches of this in this coffee. First, first chance you get. Lena reaches hesitantly for the little brown bag, a group of tension lines wrinkling her forehead. What is it, Miss Rabbit? Stop asking foolish questions, gal. You want Jim to stop fooling around in the street, don't you? Lena dabbed at the would-be tear at the corner of her eye and answered in a small voice. Oh, all right then. After you done done put to, uh, uh, two pinches of this powder in this coffee, or this food, either one, don't do nothing else for one whole day, and then, Lena May, are you listening to me? Yeah, so I'm listening, I'm just scared. If Jim found out about this, he'd beat me to death. Honey, let me tell you, Jim ain't no different from the rest of them. If you do just like I say do, 
you'll have him strolling around behind you on his eyeball by the end of the week. Okay, just listen. The day you done put the two pitches on him, don't use more than two pitches because it's mighty powerful. In exactly one day, he's going to come home from work feeling kind of bad. Might have a bad headache and his stomach could be hurting him or something. Lena dabs a bit hard at the recurring tears in the corner of her eyes. Miss Rabbit, Jim don't never have no headaches or stomach aches. He ain't never been sick in all the time we've been married. This rabbit makes an impatient gesture of despair with her hands, mouth, and eyebrow. Lena Daniel, I swear for God, I'm telling you, if you make it hard for me, I'm going to put you out of here and you'll lose that worthless bastard you married to. Lena cringes at the sound of the word describing her husband, but answers hurriedly, I'm sorry, Miss Rabbit, I'm sorry. He said, I've been so nervous and upset here lately. This rabbit strokes on the arm soothingly. I know. I know you have, honey. Now then, when he comes home feeling bad, he'll most likely want to lay down. Now then, whilst he's laying down, sleeping, trying to get rid of his headache, take these three bones. One, two, three. Take these three bones and toss them under the bed and sprinkle three more pinches of this powder lightly around the bed. Just like this, mind you. If you sprinkle too much in one place, it's apt to make him go blind in his left eye for two days. Lena Daniel squeezes the little brown bag firmly in her fist. I sure do want to thank you, Miss Rabbit. I, I'll give you a little something at the end of the week. Jim messed up his check two weeks ago. We've been having kind of hard. Not only that, Suki boy stuck a nail in his foot and we, we had to... Miss Rabbit subdues, brushes away the rest of the explanation with a brisk waving of her hand. Go on, girl. Go on. Go on. Get, get going and do. Get out here and do what I told you to do. Bring me one of them peach cobblers you make so good after you done brought your man back to his sentence. Thanks a heap, Miss Rabbit. I'm going to do exactly what you said for me to do. <laughs> you better. She ain't going to have nobody to help you with them young uns. Now go on. Get Lena opens the back door and stands there for a moment, looking down at the dark alley in front of her, and then turns back slyly, shyly, to Miss Rabbit. Night, Miss Rabbit. Night, Lena. You be careful now. Lena starts slowly down the steps, a firm line to her chin. I will. Bless you, Miss Rabbit. This rabbit closes her back door. Settles the latch and burglar's chain back into place and walks slowly back over to her sofa. Her worn house slippers making soft clap slop sounds as she goes. She picks up her Bible from the sofa, looks at it for a moment as though searching for something, and then gracefully kneels down on one knee and then the other. Dear God, dear God, I pray to you tonight. I pray to you for Lena Daniels, a blonde, blue-eyed, long-haired picture of Jesus Christ, a cross glowing on his chest, stares benevolently over Miss Rabbit's head as she prays. And that's the end of Saturday night. The second chapter, chapter 2, is entitled, He Maketh Me. And what I'm going to do is read the first page of chapter 2 to give you a little, when I reread it, as a lap over in the next reading, you'll know where we're going. First, I'll have a little sip of this tea. On the main stem, Every tenth man is apt to be some kind of prophet. Why not? Religions come and go, but men stay the same, urgent to find answers for questions they've never asked, impatient to know a God they can understand and deal with. And the preaching man is the one who has figured that much out, has delved into a few of the reasons why people want to return to places they've never been. 
The nearest storefront may smack the perceptive person's face with a feather that is almost holy. The earthy cries bouncing from inside the glass-crusted walls and out onto the Sunday morning streets like ricocheting bricks. Thunderclaps spill from black men and mohair robed with golden throats. Thrills of an ungodly nature grip the captive crowd, jerk and twist their bodies into aesthetic shapes, pull their beliefs in front of a life that they will never know here on planet Earth. They stand around in dark-suited groups after their transportation to heaven has been arranged for, shaking hands with their hearts and praying for the next revival meeting. Amen. This is Diane Hope, almost Easter Sunday sharp, stands on the front steps of her apartment, pulling on her white Sunday go-to-meeting gloves, calling up to her second-floor window. Nathan! Nathan! Nathan peeks cautiously out of the window, nodding a tie awkwardly around his neck. Yeah, what is it? And that's the beginning of chapter two. The title is in, the title of this chapter is He Maketh Me. Wow. I would like to think it's a, a religious chapter, but then the previous chapter might be considered a religious chapter too. I was surprised when you said Miss Rabbit. Remind me of your radio play, Miss Rabbit. As a matter of fact, uh, that's funny that you would notice that similarity because it is the same story. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I've written a story in about three or four forms. There's a short story uh -huh. uh, when I was writing radio plays for the Sears Radio Theater. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elliot Lewis, producer. Mm -hmm. uh, it was done as a radio play, and a good friend of mine, Helen Martin, mm -hmm. was the uh, main character, Miss Rabbit, in it. And also, uh, it's been published here and there, but originally it comes from Ghetto Sketches. Ghetto Sketches. Ah. And, uh, I've used little bits and pieces. I'll tell you a funny story. Tell me. On one occasion, in one of the forms that I've written, Ghetto uh, Miss Rabbit, mm -hmm. in one of the forms, she was blind. Yes, I remember. That was and in, in the another radio. form, she was not blind. I know, I know, I know. But I like I the, didn't pay attention to my own outline. Well, I like the development because in the radio play, she becomes blind. Yeah. That's too much. Yeah. yeah. She yeah. gives up a sight uh, in, to save in someone. compensation for doing something for somebody that she couldn't, she couldn't fulfill the promise. And uh, she had to surrender her sight. One of the things that happens when you make offerings is that mm -hmm. you have to be willing to give up something to receive something. Um, so, having said all that, uh, I'll leave philosophy behind and we'll look forward to tomorrow evening, same time? Yes, now that I can breathe again. I was holding my breath. <laughs> oh, it's happening here at Cafe Zola. Here's to you guys. Ciao. Now I get a chance to preach because it's going to be Reverend Tilly's turn. <laughs> All right. Tomorrow. You still on? Yeah, tomorrow. Get out of here. <laughs>